Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Good. I'm doing good. I was I was actually at Edmonton's. What was the final? What was the final score? Three two. Three two. Three two. Victor of the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, our our mutual friend Colin Ruddle, uh, he he gave me his tickets from Wow uh, Factor. That's the great dessert company that he works for, and I got his seats tonight. And uh, really, really enjoyed, really enjoyed the live experience. Being with, there with all those people it was just I don't know what it was. I just really I, I've only been to games now twice. This is the second time I've ever been to a game at Rogers Place because we you know do the video analysis. I always watch it from home. Right. But I I really enjoyed the game experience. I thought the orders, you know, the whole thing was was fantastic, including a great performance from the Oilers. What did you think of it, Bruce? Yeah, uh, I largely enjoyed it. It was a pretty pell mell game. Lots of penalties. Two very good power plays uh, on display tonight, and uh, they produced four of the five goals. Only the game winner by Derek Ryan was scored at even strength. And otherwise, the two teams shared on the power play tonight. Uh, Edmonton scored two goals on 18 shots and Vancouver scored two goals on 16 shots. Can you imagine? And that was in about uh, uh, roughly uh, eight minutes of power play time for Vancouver and nine for Edmonton. And they had, they each had almost 20 shots, like they were firing two shots a minute on the power play and then dangerous shots dangerous shots and two four of them went in and some great skill from both teams on oh, the power play do those guys uh-huh. ever know what to do when they get the puck they're machines they're just so you know get the puck quick move whip the puck over pass the puck so precisely quinn hughes and peterson in vancouver and you know of course the others power play with best power play in the nhl in you know three or four decades so it was a it, it is uh it's a wonder to behold and uh they're looking like they're revving it up again for another year, Bruce. I don't, you know, they're not going to, I don't think they're going to be taking a step back. They're going to create as as many great a chances as ever. We'll see what, how many goals go in, but uh, they got it going on. And, you know, between Hyman and Pulley Arvey on the, in front of the net, they're not going to miss Chase on a Neil a whole heck of a lot, I don't think. So I'll tell you what, Alex Chase on looked great for Vancouver tonight. I thought he was outstanding. Oh, I didn't even notice him. <laughs> oh, did you miss Alex Chase? Huh? I didn't. I didn't you didn't have it. the play-by-play guy telling you it was Chase. No, on. that's it. And I was watching, and I, you was, know, I watched. He was the... doing Alex Chase on things, screening the goalie, winning puck battles. He fired one rocket off the crossbar. You heard him, even if you didn't know it was him, uh, in the uh, in the second period. And uh, look at anyway. So I, I'm a Chase on fan, and I'm. Not shy about saying that, and I think Vancouver will sign him. And I mean, he was playing on the first line and first power play. <laughs> He's a good hockey player. Yeah, he and, and the Oilers could really use him right now, especially if Cassian's injured from that fight tonight. Like, and we'll get to that. But uh, if you know, with Archibald and Cassian out, boy, w- wouldn't it be nice to have Chase on right now? Is he signed there yet? Maybe they should quickly call him up and offer him a contract. How about that? Didn't Calgary do that to the Orders with uh, two, for two times for two to get it done? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Are you trolling people, Bruce? I, you know, oh, yeah. I don't, you, <laughs> that's what I thought. Okay, good for you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, this is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast. It's because it's an owner's win. Well, you know, we generally, not always, we go with two good things each. So, Bruce, start it off. What is your first good thing? Oh, I've got to go with Mike Smith tonight. Uh, I, I had I had uh, him picked out early for his offensive plays when he was making the long bombs, three stretch passes that he made in this game, uh, one of which earned him an assist, one of which set up a breakaway that didn't wind up uh, scoring. And the third one that kind of got messed up by the forwards with three times he caught Vancouver on the line change with the 120 foot pass from the, from the just above the goal line to the far blue line and uh, uh, caught Vancouver a little bit with their pants down. And like I say, he earned an assist. So, so that part was good, but what elevates him to my first good thing is the net winding. 
I mean, 38 shots he faced, 36 saves, and uh, you know, 16 shots in the third period with a with a one goal lead, and he just made it stand up for the whole third period. And he made some tough saves in that third period. They were battling hard. They were getting in his face. And he got in their face at least one time. There was a scrum with Smith, Smith right in the middle of it. And uh, he just showed his uh, his combative uh, showboat form. And yeah, it's, it's he's fun to watch. You got to admit, David, that, that he Bruce, is a fun goalie to watch. Even if you don't like him, he sure is watchable. Who couldn't like him? Well, I mean, some people don't. I, you he's, know, I mean, he, you might, what, he might be getting, he might suddenly fall off a cliff because he's old, but. Oh, geez, Boy, like, I didn't see one sign of him being uh, having lost a, off of tonight's performance, which was his first 60-minute game of yeah. the season. Yeah, we'll see if he stays healthy, but we'll see if any of the players stay healthy. Yeah. Like, it's a, t- it's a rough, tough game. Anyone can get injured. I mean, he, he, he again, he had hit an historic year last season. You know, probably, arguably, the best season ever for a goalie of his, in his age category. And... He was fantastic. One of the reasons that people downgrade the Oilers constantly, consistently this year is always mentioned as the goaltending, the goaltending, the goaltending. Well, they did have two, like the, that tandem last year is up and down as they were and as old as Mike Smith was. They were one of the best tandems in the NHL last season. And I'm just, if they can stay healthy, you know, the way I look at it, Bruce Smith had a great year last year. Koskinen had a great year the year before. Between the two of them, one of them should probably have a pretty good year this year. And, you know, chances are that they're not going to both be rancid at the same time. These are both goalies with pretty good track records. So, I, I based on just my reaction to Mike Smith, I, like Adam Larson left. He was my previous favorite player. Mike Smith is my new favorite oiler, the way right. he plays the game. I just loved his, you know, the in-your-face in stuff when, when people get in his face. And his passing of the puck, he almost scored a goal, which would have just been fantastic, obviously. But his passing of the puck is is dramatic and effective. There was one point, I think it was in the third period, Oilers might have had a power play, where the puck was dumped in the Oilers' end, and he did a cross-seam pass across his own zone right in front of the a Vancouver player. And he it, he just drilled. Like, the only way that pass isn't picked off, it is a high-risk pass in any case. And you could see it was maybe there, but the only way that happens is if you just drill that pass. And he drilled it. Right I know, he's tape, got, right? He has got he he that is unbelievable confidence yeah. in your passing ability, which he has, and he just goes for it. And then there's his whole look, right? Like mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever, if you watch The Walking Dead, but I don't like. There's a character character Daryl there. I don't know if Mike Smith and Daryl have been seen in the same room because it might be the same guy. <laughs> There, he, he just has this kind of, you know, been fighting zombies for 10 years and killed about 10,000 of them look to him. He's he's a he's an incredibly charismatic player. And I can see, you know, it, it, you know, Ken Holland has talked about having gray beards on the team, right? The importance of that. And you can kind of you can get a sense of that watching a player like him. And tonight also watching Duncan Keith and some of the other veteran players like it, it, they do uh, have a presence on the ice. And if they can continue to perform at near peak levels, I mean, which is astonishing if they can, it's, you know, it's, it's, that's a rarity, but uh, if those two things come in one package, that's a pretty good package. Well, you talk uh, about presence, that's something you really, you really sense that more when you're in the building too. Don't yeah. You? Yeah. You don't, there's, there's a certain, there's yeah. a certain aura around certain players that, that you almost can sense even from the stands. Same with, and tonight I've with McDavid and Dreisaitl. I just got a feeling like they own, this is their league now. They own this league. Wow. Like we were starting to get a sense that in the last few years that McDavid was, you know, he was like, he's the, he was a man among men, right? He was like one of the, one of the guys, but now he's like the owner. And uh, yeah, I think in terms of his play, we're going to see a different level. And again, looking far into the future, especially in the playoffs. My good thing, Bruce, was another veteran, Tyson Berry, who mm-hmm. um, Jim Playfair was talking to Jason Greger the other day, which is I a fantastic what interview. What a great interview. Yeah, yeah G- listen you know, to Greger that. Does... Go and find that interview and listen to it, hockey fans. That was, that was really informative. Greger does a good job often of digging into technical things with coaches. Mm-hmm. I wish um, he's one of the few members of the media who really focuses on that. And I think it's a, just a great service to fans when, when that kind of um, – um, 
thing is done by the media, you know, and just not all the normal questions, but picking it apart and Playfair got into the four four ways that they rate players on their defensive play, you know, keeping the puck in the zone, getting it deep, guarding the middle of the ice, advancing the puck in the defensive slot, and he went through each of the Oilers' defensemen. Oh. With Tyson Berry, he talked about, Playfair talked about um, how Berry and he together were working on a plan for the season, which really involved taking care of things defensively and trying to to change Barry's game in that regard. And I think I've made comments in the past, like, and maybe you have too, like he is what he is. He's not changing defensively. And last year it was like, let's, let's, let's be honest there. It was, it was bad. A lot of the time with Tyson Barry on the ice defensively, he was a weak defensive hockey player, the worst defensive defenseman on the Oilers last year. And it wasn't that close. So that's why, you know, I think it, it sunk in maybe with Barry, like when he went to market this year, this is what Playfair was, I think, talking about, you know, that maybe that's something you got to work on because that maybe that haunted him and his valuation from other teams here. He's leading the league in points and the best he can do is a three-year deal, right? With what was it? Four and a half a year. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Barry talked about focusing on that and taking care of the little things. And that's what I saw tonight. Bruce was a player and I could be wrong about this because, again, I watched it live. I didn't go over the video, but I, I saw other almost every other defenseman make mistakes that led to grade-A chances against. I can't recall, and may, maybe I'm wrong, but I can't recall anything from Barry in that regard. Just a solid game. And capped off, the icing on the cake was on the power play in the first period. He did one 360 spinorama, oh, which was absolutely delicious. It was just such a fantastic move. Like, the skating... I'm- the puck skill that is that is involved in pulling off that kind of move at high speed in a game. What a skilled hockey player Tyson Berry is as well. So I heard the crowd gasp when that happened. Did you gasp, David? I, I gasped and I thought, oh man, I like if I was at the crossroads and that was offered up, you could do that move in an NHL game, I'd be tempted, Bruce. Like that was that was special. That was just a great move and a real display like yeah, you're Leon and Connor and Nuge. You're not the only ones who got some uh, some globe trotter game uh, on this team. He really uh, really showed it there. The odd thing tonight was Barry was the third most for the right defenseman in ice time. Both Bouchard and uh, Cece got more time than Barry. Of course, big part of that is he had zero time on the penalty kill, but he does get power play time. Yeah, but tonight he wasn't even necessarily on the top unit. Me. Uh, because he got he got less power play time than uh, than did uh, Nurse Carl Nurse. Oh. Yeah, well they want to give Nurse some power power play reps too and see what he can do. And uh, what is your second good thing, Bruce? Yeah, I'm gonna go back to the big diesel Leon Drysaddle. Another terrific game that he had tonight. Seven shots on net to to co lead. The game in a, a very high event game where there was 81 shots between the two teams, 42-39 were the shots of the orders. Of course, the power plays are part of it. That's where Leon got most of his shots. But also a couple of passes he made, a backhand pass from just inside his own blue line that that sprung Yessa Pugliarvi on a breakaway. Just a little flick of the wrist backhand, and all of a sudden JP's behind the defense and going in on goal and he couldn't solve Yarrow Lack on the on the deep, but it was, you know, a grade A chance. And then another it was just an unbelievable pass from the boards. Again off the backhand. Where the puck came to Leon, it looked like he was covered by a guy and just the puck came whizzing across the ice right on McDavid's stick and he was alone in front. And he tried to deco Lack and jammed it into his pads. Like basically he set two both of his line line mates in clear on the goalie. Out of nowhere on both of them, just just phenomenal. So he really he has. Had, he had uh, 11 shots tonight. He was the best oiler on the dot, 57 percent. Nothing new there. Yeah. And uh, just uh, just such a quality player. I was a little bit worried. He got bonked in the head early in the second period. He took a hit just uh, just at the blue line, first shift of the second period, and it stopped him in his tracks. And he shook his head and went to the bench. And you know he always wait and hope the guy comes out for his next shift. And that was when uh, 
uh, Connor McDavid went and mugged a guy from Vancouver, and it turned out it was the very guy that had hit Liam. Oh, oh good for him. William Lockwood, number 58, whoever he is, he uh, he took a run at Leon, and both uh, uh, McDavid and Drysaddle took their pound of flesh off of Lockwood later. Leon really bounced the guy at oh, the blue line. That was so great. That was so great. <laughs> I love that play. And that was the same guy that had got him, right? So uh, yeah. Leon... Like he he uh, you know he's got he's got a little bit of an edge to him, but he's particularly got an edge to him if if he's in a got a feud going with someone, that guy's going to pay, one way or another. And and Lockwood paid on that play. He got bounced hard, and and uh, yeah. and McDavid took a couple of runs at him. So I didn't mind that seeing them stick up uh, sticking up for each other. But uh, oh. anyway, that's my. Uh, that's my second good thing. With the goodest thing of all being that Leon did not suffer any kind of a of a of an injury on and that's the sort of thing you're just terrified of in preseason games, right? So and again, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But. Indeed, indeed, yeah. Live versus the size of Leon's blade on his stick. I think if you measured it, the blade is longer than the shaft. That's how it looks like. It's just this. It's like he's got a he's he's converted a lawnmower into his hockey stick or something. <laughs> <laughs> It's just it's the most amazing utensil, you know. I I can't recall like Bobby Hull's stick was pretty cool too, like that huge blade, the you know curved stick. Huge curve, yeah. Yeah. Curve. But this is yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the, to say. The scythe, the scythe, yeah. Executioner's scythe. We talked about the shot. Well, he's a... <laughs> The executioners, yeah. He's got the right utensil, the right tool. My other good thing, Bruce, was the third line, and it's going to run into my bad thing, which is, of course, Cassian getting hurt in that fight, which is just, live was just horrible. It was horrible. But uh, that line, I thought, really played well, and Cassian was a part of it. Like, they they forechecked well. They had a number of really good shifts in the offensive end. Ryan is a very smart player, and he's good with the puck. He scored a beautiful goal off a of Duncan Keith uh, shot. Nice, nice uh, offensive, uh, you know, virtuous cycle there, ending in a goal with uh, Ryan deflecting it in. And Fogel is, he's uh, he's tough and he's hardworking. He's all over the ice, working, uh, grinding. I, I like the player a lot. You know, a first impression. Cassian uh, had his best game. He was hitting people. Um, making some plays, um, seems scary out there. I don't know. I think they might have, he might have fought McEwen. I don't know if McEwen had run Smith. I'm not, I think that might have been it, but I'm not exactly McEwen sure. He was running everybody. That guy's going to be a big pain in the butt, I can tell you already. Yeah. He was so at he, the end of last season. He had a couple of games where you're going, who's that guy? Somebody needs to tune him in. Yeah. Cassian died. Yeah. So Cassian agreed to fight and, mm-hmm. uh, Sure did. You know, when you're fighting a guy with a f- visor, I mean, Cassian w- punched him a couple times right in the visor, got the first punch right in the visor. Like, what is the point almost in fighting this goon? Like, it's just, it's just, there's, he, normally you punch him in the face, maybe he'd go down and that's the end of the fight. Cassian hits him twice in the face, he might break his hand. It just seems futile um, to fight the guy, honestly, unless they're both taking their helmets off. And then at the end, of course, Cassian's arms are pinned and he and his head smashes into the ice. He's not, and it looks like, I mean, it was hor- he was not moving oh. for a while there. And it was scary and it was, it just seemed scary and senseless um, that this had happened in the game. So I like, they're still fighting in hockey. This is part of it, but this is... It, as as this goes along, Bruce, I just can't. In the last decade or fifteen years, the number of Oilers who have been badly injured in fights is, I can you need two at least two hands, I think, to count them. And it's happened a lot. It has happened a lot, and this is a reason I just uh, I'm. I hope I first of all I hope Zach Cassian's okay. Oh, nice. That was it, and you know it's a you're fighting a guy as big and tough as Zach McEwen wearing of who's wearing a face mask. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty gutsy thing to do to stand up for your team in that way. So I I do respect that aspect of what he was doing there. I get it, but uh, it was just it was hard to watch. And um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, McEwen right off the bat when he first <clears throat> reached out to grab his sweater, he, he kind of got his fingers hooked up in the 
uh, under the helmet. Yeah. And, and the strap. And he pulled the helmet right off, off right off the bat. And the, the linesman supposedly, when a helmet comes off, they're supposed to get in there right away and stop the fight. Well, they didn't. Uh, on the other hand, if you were a linesman, would you like to get, get in there between t two willing combatants of that, uh, you know, that just when they're getting going, the fists are flying. And the, anyway, the linesman didn't get in there. And, You'd uh, think they're, if they knew the technique, if they had the mm -hmm. proper technique, they would know they, yeah. they might be able to do that. I'm just, and I don't know. That, if, that is the rule because it's guys hitting their head on the ice. That's the big danger. I mean, Don Sanderson, wasn't it? That uh, was playing senior hockey that died in uh, Toronto or somewhere in central Ontario anyway. And, and uh, uh, in a fight, and it was because his helmet came off. And then over the course of the fight, he went down and banged his head off the ice and you know, and that's basically what we saw there. McCaskey couldn't really get his hands free. And uh, McEwen kind of followed through when he fell, fell on him. Like, I don't think he was trying to drive his head into the ice, but essentially that's what happened. There's, there's some anger out there on Twitter, but. It is a fight, know. like, it's, too. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a fight. And in the spur of the moment, might something crazy like that happen? Like, it's not exactly... Right. Todd Bertuzzi, trying right? Trying to take like, him down hard, but you're not trying to yeah. bounce his head off the ice. Oh, uh, yeah. Just... Anyway, anyway, he bounced his head off the ice, and he lay still. And then the great Vancouver-based uh, commentary team talked about how at least Cassian's skating off the ice on his own. And I counted five people, two trainers and three teammates that were assisting him to the bench. And he had a, he wasn't bleeding, but he had a towel on the side of his head. And somebody, uh, again on Twitter, uh, claimed to have been at the game sitting behind the bench, and they said he had a big lump on the side of his head the size of a baseball, which, you know. <laughs> anyway, you can see how you got a, one of those instant big lumps. Yeah. I mean, I've had them myself. It was like his head stopped a Nolan Ryan fastball. Um, yeah, Bruce, it's – so I don't – we, we recently heard about uh, Alan May on Oilers now was talking about a fight he had with Kevin McClellan that set him back like a whole, at least a month. Like he had been training like crazy all summer and he got in a fight and he got sucker punched in, in wow. camp by McClellan. He was talking about, and he just said it totally yeah. set him back for a month and he just didn't feel right. And it's hard to imagine that, Ka that Cassian's going to rebound quickly from this. It could happen if he's l monumentally lucky, mm -hmm. but he could be this this could set him and the orders back i mean he's a valuable hockey player if he plays like that on the third line that, that line had something going on and the orders right now are short on gritty wingers so yeah. bet you this could they the waiver wire could be uh buzzing a little bit in edmonton right if there you could see that if there is a, that kind of gritty tough winger coming free right now they're down Archibald and Cassian, probably Cassian. So um, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, for well, they're down Archibald, up. Cassian, and Kara. Three of their, arguably yeah. their three most physical forwards last year. And two of them are gone, and Cassian we don't know about. I do know that he's being listed as supposedly Edmonton's enforcer, if that, you know, in terms of also sleep, but... Uh, last year he had one fight and he got hurt and he missed a few weeks. This year he's had one fight and he got hurt. You know, I mean, uh, I keep hearing about how injuries are rare in fighting, but on geez, the fights I watch, it seems like guys get hurt fairly frequently. I think what the orders have last year: ten fights, two serious injuries. No. So, and we can recall Ethan Morrow, Sheldon Surrey. Uh, just though there are a couple of the big examples in recent. In, that was you know 10 that was 12 yeah, years ago they, i guess yeah they both basically ago. missed an entire season because of a fight yeah okay what is your what is your bad thing bruce oh uh, well, the uh the gritty wing winger on the waiver wire i mean orders have colton sevier playing on the fourth line or at least he was there tonight and he's their sort of uh the PTO is kind of like the preseason equivalent of the waiver wire, where you bring a guy in and kind of get him for free and try him out for a bit. And if you like what you see, you sign him. If you don't, you you know you wave him again. Is what you do with the waiver pickup during the season. And uh, 
he had, he had some okay moments in this game, but there was one dreadful moment, and it wasn't just him, it was his whole line. And the Oilers had just given up the 2-1 goal that got Vancouver back in the game. And after McDavid had tackled that guy that had hit uh, Dreisaitl, Vancouver scored beauty on the power play. And they sent out the third or fourth line of Ryan McLeod with Sevier and Benson for an own zone face-off against the Pedersen line. Well, that's asking for trouble in and of itself. Trouble did, in fact, ensue. And yes. they were on the ice for one minute and seven seconds, of which they spent the first full minute chasing the puck in their own zone. And finally, they got a hold of it, and Ryan McLeod got it just inside his own blue line, with his wingers breaking into second, center ice, and he kind of flubbed the pass yeah. into the middle of the ice. Sevier just it was in front of him, and he didn't react to it. Benson, it was coming towards Benson, but he actually skated away from it while the puck was just kind of dribbling into the neutral zone. So all three forwards were, I mean, it was a lousy pass by, by McLeod, but neither of his wingers had a, had a proper response. Go toward the puck, go hard toward the puck, and at least try and tie it up or do something. And Chicago came flying back up, not Chicago, uh, Vancouver came flying up the middle of the ice and Duncan Keith, former Chicago, that's where that came from, uh, took a penalty. And just like that, it was now it was 2-2 because Vancouver again scores a beauty on that mm -hmm. power play. And so you think, well, the penalty kill was a fail. Whoever took those penalties, that was a fail. But in fact, to me, the biggest fail in the whole sequence of plays was that fourth line shift where they just... Uh, when they got the puck, they couldn't make a you know a competent play to get it to center, get it deep, get off. And I don't again. Those guys played hard. I thought Tyler Benson had some good shifts. He had uh, he had three hits in this game, but no shots, and maybe one or two decent passes, but nothing that I think we were counting high danger scoring chance, chance you know grade A scoring chance like we usually do, David. I'm not sure if Tyler Benson's been involved in one yet, like in the preseason. So it's um, it's. I thought it was his best game. Mm -hmm. I thought it was his yeah. best game. And and uh, he did throw one hellacious hit on somebody. I don't know who yes. it was, but he, he really he really hit someone hard, and he he made yep. some good passes. McLeod though, Bruce, mm -hmm. I am not seeing it. Like he like I think he flubbed that pass. I don't know what yes. was going yeah, on. Ba yeah, badly. He flubbed the pass, and but he was he is not bringing anything close to his A game right now. It's like his D game. Like it's it's like if they didn't need another center and if they, if he didn't have such promise, he'd be gone. Like he'd be in the AHL by now. He's done nothing to, or little or nothing to, I mean, I haven't seen anything uh, to earn a spot in the NHL this year. I think that I wouldn't be surprised if he sent down. The only thing that would stop that from happening is a need at center and then a need at forward. Like they might need some forwards here because people are, the injuries are starting to pile up. With Yamamoto missing, and now we'll see what happens with Cassian. So, so there is that that opportunity, but he is not uh, done well. Sevier, I mean, he blocked a shot on the penalty kill. That was good, but I'm, I, I he, he just seems, you know. Well, I went on about it last podcast, so I won't do that again. I, uh, I, I don't see the great value there, and again, it, it just might speak to the need to bring in a waiver wire player right. here. Um, well, they, look, they sure got to look at this point with all yeah, these, they do with all these injuries and and you know the uh, you want wingers on your fourth line. Well, I think Brendan Perlini is in there with a silver yeah. bullet. Yeah, and then yeah. otherwise, I mean, who's really winning the battle for uh, for uh, winger jobs at the bottom of the roster? It looks like Devin Shore is going to probably play center. It's my yeah. take. I mean, he's badly well, outplayed Ryan McLeod to this point. McLeod is. I know whatever you had going on last spring, he just doesn't seem to to have it going on right now. I wouldn't mind Benson, Perlini, and Shore. Um, if Yamamoto comes back, of course, Turris bumps down. So we'll see how this all plays out. We'll see what we'll see what. Maybe there'll be maybe there'll be unexpectedly good news with Cassian, and he won't be out for a long period of time here. Maybe it's just like he got lucky. Um, even if he if he did lose get knocked out. I mean, it's hard to imagine though that it's going to play out that way, but fingers crossed. Your number, Bruce. 
Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, number 19. That's the number of shots on net by the big three Oilers tonight. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl, seven. Connor McDavid, five. Darnell Nurse, seven. Those guys were firing, firing, firing away all night. Uh, they all hit the score sheet. Uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl both had a goal and assist. Nurse had an assist. Uh, they all played a fair bit on the power play, which is where a lot of those shots came from. But when the when the big guns are firing, it's it's good news for the Oilers, and they were they were all they were all um, uh, let fly, and some pretty good chances in there too. I mean, uh, Halak made some nice saves, and so they uh, they kind uh, of kind of uh, I thought that stood out. And my honorable mention number, I know this isn't allowed, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mike Smith <laughs> credited with an assist, a shot on goal, and a missed shot. <laughs> shot on goal came on the penalty kill when he came out to play a puck and he fired it 200 feet right on the Vancouver net and that's the shot he wanted to get later when he took a crack at the empty net and missed it by about three or four feet uh, so that was fun to watch though I'll say yeah. alrighty uh, my number is well I'm going to give a bunch of numbers for Cody CC. Uh, the first one is 24, though. That was the second most shifts in the game for an Edmonton Oiler after Darnell Nurse. And I thought he and Duncan Keith, f- for the first time here, looked like a, like a pretty good uh, pair of hockey players out there. Um, they weren't perfect. They Penalties. gave up They gave up one chance. They each took a penalty. But uh, I, I really, I, I liked how active CeCe was. And he seemed to be involved in the play but playing within himself. And Keith made a number of really smart passes in the defensive zone to him. Um, He'd get the puck and then he'd kind of reverse it uh, off the boards to CeCe. He did it a couple times. I thought they looked good. And so CeCe's numbers are yet, and he's his plus minus plus one. He he played 1807 with the 24 shifts. Mm -hmm. Uh, Three shots, two hits, a giveaway, and two block shots. So again, it's just... Uh, the, the only negative thing there is the giveaway, and uh, uh, but a lot of there was lots of good little things. I, I liked his, I thought his battling was good, his skating was good. Maybe he's going to be okay. And again, I I keep stressing this. I, I'm not going to like I I need to see him for about five to ten games to get a real sense of the player. It took that long with you know in a negative way with Turris. You know, after about five or ten games, we kind of knew what we had there, and then it didn't really get that much better. But Let's let's wait. I think you know because there's a lot of jumping on these players really quickly, Keith and CC, from people who didn't like those deals, and and I didn't like those deals. Like and some people liked them less than I did, so that's the temptation then to is to jump on it and say, oh, I was right. But I think that you know if you're going to be a fair observer of the game and maybe even a good fan, if that's in your repertoire, <laughs> give these guys the benefit of the doubt. Give them ten games before you, you you really start to sharpen that knife because who knows how it's going to turn out. You know, I've been really super bullish on Evan Bouchard, for instance, like thinking that he's going to be a big answer on the orders. Well, tonight I thought, and you, you pointed out this last game, and I thought tonight Bouchard, lots of stray passes. Mm-hmm. Like he he's, he's looking like, you know, he's having a moment here where he's going to have to figure things out. The speed of this game is a little bit more than maybe he's expecting. He's catching up to it. And maybe he's are playing with a new new partner in Chris Russell tonight, right. uh, you know, adjusting to that. Like, there's all kinds of things he's got to constantly adjust to, and he might struggle. You know, we're all expecting him to ace it. Well, maybe it's going to be CC and Keith who will ace it. We don't know. I'm just saying, let's be patient like, with, before mm-hmm. crowning Evan Bouchard as the heir apparent, which I have a tendency to do with players, to be overly enthusiastic about them. But also, uh, you know, before we pile on these two guys, and I, I thought CC and Keith looked fine. Yeah, well, they betrayed him. They took three penalties, which is obviously is not ideal. But um, there, there was some good uh, movement of the puck. I thought they were they were okay. Like that's the key's real strength, I think, is uh, yeah, getting to pucks quickly and get like, giving himself enough time to make the play with him. And he's a pretty good passer. And that was a fine point shot he let go that Ryan tipped home for the game winner. So you know, assist on the game winning goal. Let's give him a point for that at least. And um, if you want to look for flaws, you can find them in any player. That's, you know, if you're hell-bent on finding yeah. what's wrong with them. 
Let me find something. He allowed, there was one play where he got kind of picked off in front of the net and there was a good chance from his man, but he was, he was, he was, he was almost there. Like it wasn't like he was wandering in no man's land. Like he was, he was trying to get there. He read the play, right? He just wasn't quick enough. But uh, what I was impressed with, with Keith was his quickness on the ice. Like he, for, he's not obviously as lightning quick as he used to be. Right. He's still a very quick and smart hockey player. And it reminded me, like we've seen other defensemen, um, you know, it, it, you know, mandatory 1970 sports references at the end of their career, like Pat Stapleton and JC Trombley in the, in the WHA in, oh. in their waning years. And it kind of, he kind of reminded me like the old smart old Fox playing hockey out there. Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of what I saw in his game tonight was someone who doesn't have the game that he had when he was 10 years younger, but still has some game and some, some real smarts on the ice. And, and I saw that on a number of different plays. Unfortunately, he still got the contract he had when he was 10 years younger, but don't get me started. <laughs> that was a pretty good contract he signed for all those years until yeah, now. Was. got the tail end it of it. Yeah, was. that's you know, Holland should have done better on it, Bruce. He should have sharpened his pencil on that, obviously. it's. I don't think there's... Does anyone really disagree with that, except for maybe like a few people who this really are in Holland's corner? Like, we're not, not against Holland, but oh, I just think wow. it is. Yeah, totally you know, fair hey. comment that he should have done better on that deal. So anyway, the proof will be in the pudding of that is Duncan Keith, and we'll see how he responds to the new challenge of playing on a new team for the first time in his pro career, and to uh, 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 you know taking on a, a on a leadership role and and uh, finding the fountain of youth a little bit. Uh, and hopefully for him, playing with a more stable partner than he's had the last couple of years in in uh, Chicago. Uh, I saw things to like in Duncan Keith's game tonight. Let's put it that way. Yeah, CeCe is a veteran player, right? He's 27, isn't he? So like this this should be the prime of his defensive Five career. Games. Yeah, just like Mark Fain when he came here. All right. <laughs> Bruce, uh, I think we've covered the, covered the uh, territory of that game. Right. Um, any other thoughts or... What's up next, Vancouver Saturday? Vancouver again on Saturday, and then Vancouver for reals on uh, next Wednesday, the, the uh, season opener on, uh, on the 13th uh, to Yikes. kick off Here the campaign. Go. So one more game, and then there'll be a bunch of uh, paper shuffling and uh, roster moves, maybe a waiver wire pickup. I'd say there's, uh, they got to look now. I think there's they, they, the right player type. <clears throat> comes available. Well, Bob Stoffer on Oilers now mentioned that he was watching the waiver wires, and if a particular player came available, then he he thought the Oilers might jump. Now, of course, if the Oilers are interested in a player, there's there's how many teams ahead of them in, in the queue, like to to take a player. 20. So we're not going to be getting, you know, mm -hmm. we're not going to be getting the second coming of whomever of Zach Hyman or. Uh, you know, we're not going to be getting a really good winger or Warren Fogel class winger. We're going to be getting a, you know, someone who might compete with Colton Sevier. Right. It's, it's well, if they like don't it. pick a waiver, a waiver winger, I think they will sign Colton Sevier and have him or around. Or both. You know? Did they, has Vancouver signed Chase on? Do we know? Not that I've heard, but I bet I will. Yeah, that'd be, the, I bet you they will first too. First line, first power play. I mean, it's late in the exhibition season. I saw some of his game in Calgary the other night. It was the same thing. It was on the power play and they had three great shots in a row and the goalie didn't see any of them. All he saw was Alex Chase on his butt cheeks, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he is a fantastic power player. We always said it, Bruce. We always gave him his due at, at that particular task. And a great defensive winger. In a fourth line role, good defensive winger. He's not. He doesn't skate well enough to be a great winger. Yeah, he's not. He's very game. responsible. Very yeah. responsible and, and smart guy. If he's a smart player, he really is. He, yeah. So he I totally always is. I always admired that about his game, and the Oilers will miss that. But uh, they've got other guys coming in to do the job. But anyway, he won't be on waivers. I think they'll sign him, and he'll be on the team. Well, they wouldn't. Yeah, he he yeah. wouldn't be put on waivers. Like they just right. no, he just they either sign him or don't. So goes back in the pond. I'm yeah. saying the ownership pull over Stieg here and sign him right under their nose. All right, divert him at the airport tonight. 
exactly. Don't <laughs> let him get out of town. Yeah. Right. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks for talking tonight. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>